Good evening and good day, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day and you are ready to learn a bit more on our new topic tonight. And it's good to be back with Dr. Anna Pudward. Hi, Dr. Anna, how are you feeling tonight? Thank you much. I am fantastic being with you. Thank you so much for joining us once again, because I'm not sure if you had a chance to already be here last week on Wednesday, because actually Dr. Pudjwar was here already and she already talked about uh, male factor uh, fertility and tonight she has, uh, she will be talking about a different um, topic, but also on male uh, fertility and this time she will explain more, she will talk about toxins, chromatin, oxidative stress and i'm very happy to have you back for sure it's been an interesting uh, session that we had last week and i'm sure it's going to be interesting this time as well i'm your host caroline and as always just let me remind everyone that we will start with the presentation and afterwards as always it will be time for your questions so don't hesitate put the questions in the chat section during the presentation or afterwards and uh, dr anna will definitely answer them for you and uh, let me just also mention that uh, dr anna uh, is uh, an andrologist experienced andrologist at repro clinic um located in beautiful barcelona and um, well i can only uh, say that um is it's uh, it's definitely uh, uh we are very proud that uh, dr pujvert is uh, is also um helping us out with this topic because uh, she is definitely someone that you should uh, have a look at if you know that there are some male factors problems she is definitely someone to to ask so don't hesitate okay and uh, yeah let's start with the presentation then okay okay dr anna perfect perfect let's go ahead thank you so much well um well good night everybody we have um, almost all of us finished our job, but we must continue explaining you what's the male factor about toxin and oxidative alteration that you know that nowadays is one of the most important reasons of having infertility, uh, male infertility. Well, we will start knowing about the definition. Spermatozoa of infertile male are suggest to carry more DNA damage and that's increased the transmission of genetic disease. This is also due to oxidative stress that is in an, an imbalance between the amount of reactive oxygen in species and the major cause of male infertility nowadays. And then even we can measure it. No? And who are those elements that produce this uh, oxidative stress? They are called chemical, chemical endocrine disruptors. No? that are estrogen-like and or anti-androgen substances that interfere in all the aspects of the reproductive and sexual hormonal mechanism in men. And it is really a great problem nowadays because we are surrounded of all those kinds of elements of, that produce not only toxics in, in, in the fertility, but in the health of people. What they can do, they can imitate, replace, transmute the cyber-hormonal control system and they can become an antagonist of the natural function of those hormones uh, in the target organs. That one of the most important of them are in the testicles. So they act in the hypothalamus through different hormones, the FSH, that produce the activity of certain cells that helps to maturate the spermatogenesis. They can change it, they can uh, imitate it, they can change the attitude, uh, the, the, the feedback, they can do all what they want, and that is the great problem, that sometimes we even doesn't know what is happening. We only know they, they, they disorganize the normal activity of these hormones. And what do they look like? All what we, they, uh, in our society, we are surrounded, produce directly or indirectly uh, oxidative uh, products or uh, endocrinological uh, um, products that can produce uh, this uh, alteration of fertility. 
what we are, uh, uh, the respiration, what we are eating, the leakage through the, the water, all of those kinds of things can produce these uh, endocrine disruptors. Um, they doesn't act sometimes directly. They need sometimes, for example, water or different kinds of plastics that produce these kind of alterations. Here you have all the pathologies that produce the oxidative stress directly to the spermatozoa. System, uh, in system is uh, infection, pollution, smoking, drugs, our way, how we are living nowadays, uh, diabetes, the, your, the quality, what you are eating also affect this. They produce uh, abnormal spermatozoa, they, uh, they alter the, 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 the transit through the epididymos that we have been talking last, last week, and they affect uh, the, the prostate, and they produce then finally um, an infertility that we must evaluate when we have someone who has um, infertility. And how do they act? Through the inhalation, skin contact, direct or indirectly, have we have seen intake, can be concentrated dependent, if, if it is more concentrated, can be worse. It can indirectly through its metabolites and can act in a specific environment situation. I remember one kind of plastic that was used for vegetable that doesn't produce infertility or oxidative stress uh, uh, in men. But the metabolites in uh, four degrees uh, in, the, in the freezer can produce it. So it has been changed and removed it. Nowadays, we doesn't have this kind of plastic. Each of them can act in a specific or summatory effect. If you have more than one of these substances, the summatory of the, uh, the effect of all of them can produce this kind of uh, situation. So they are very difficult to study, even to identify, identify them, it's because we must know exactly how they can act, where they can act, and with kind of different toxics can uh, act more uh, severely. Then they produce alteration and decrease of the fertility capacity. I'm talking always about men, but in women also it's the same thing. Alteration of the sexual function, view of the alteration of the hormones like testosterone, LH and Leydig cells. Alteration of the sexual development in kids before uh, um, growing up, induction of cancer in male organs as uh, testicular cancer, alteration of all the axis of the um, production of hormones in the potalamus, if it's a testicular, they can do disorder of the thyroid gland and also an alteration of autoimmune system that, can, they, that they can alter in the um, sexual and uh, reproductive male organs. The impact is terrible because they act, as you hear, as you see here, in all those hormones that produce or participate in the production of the spermatozoa. In the testicular history, histology, it's the, the image which we can see inside the testicle, it produces an impairment of testicular evolution. They, they stop the, 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 the growing of the testicular uh, tissue. They make an induction of tissue necrosis. They, they, they kill the spermatozoa before being the spermatozoa. Leydig cell block that will not recognize a leg and protecting hormone, so they will doesn't act, they will doesn't product, produce testosterone. They change the morphology of the seminous tubules that where we have the stem cells of the spermatozoa to become uh, a mature spermatozoa. They alter the, the germ cells during the division of the, the chromosomes they increase the percentage of tool without spermatogenesis. So we will have lower quantity of spermatozoa and there's different types of maturation of the spermatozoa. And even they change the seminal fluid that is produced in the prostate. Here you can have a normal tubule, similar tubule, where you see the sperms, the mature spermatozoa, spermatid, and here you have the the, um, the certain cells that can that helps to mature this 
these, these stem cells to becoming uh, sperms. And here you have those different uh, alterations that we have seen before as uh, a high percentage of, uh, of tubule of spermatid phase that can block. So we don't have, as you, see, as you can see here, any kind of spermatozoa as you hear, you can hear, look here. Here it doesn't have certain cells, even no Leydig cells that you then, these men will doesn't produce enough testosterone to maintain, to maintain their sexual habits or reproductive uh, style. And who is exposed? Every one of all, of all, all the time are exposed to have uh, the intoxication of this kind of products. From the embryo, the evolution of the embryo before the breath, that's, that's terrible. We are not protected. But the most important victim are the testicles of men. They, they are, they, the testicles are acting as a, a target organ where this uh, disruptor of endocrine have the best affinity because it's very, very protected. The testicle, as you know, it's very protected. So there it can uh, act directly. Okay. They have a very, very straight relationship between testicle and toxins. And, they are, and we have seen already, they act in all those areas, in the testicle, in the seminary tubule, in the development of the stem cells until the mature sperm, in all the division of the spermatogenesis, so they can produce different types of mutations and the quality of the spermatozoa. They can change the quantity, the movement, the motility, and the morphology of this spermatozoa. So it's very difficult to detect where they are. Already in 1918, uh, World Organization Health determined that reproductive toxicology as a very important specialty. Because every year we have more than 30,000 new products that can become in the future as a toxic for fertile, uh, fertile people. And this is terrible because almost all the kind of studies, they look for different types of toxicity, but there are very low studies to protect the fertility of human being. One of the persons that have worked a lot about it is Laura Waldenberg from, from Australia. And look what she says, not already in, in 2017. Early life exposure to chemical and chemical mixture can predispose individual to disease that manifests later in life. In the embryo and when you are an adult, you can have those alterations already. How low doses of chemical during critical windows of development, like in embryos or just before uh, becoming a baby, can alter gene expression, cell differentiation, tissue organization, and subtle ways that can lead to other diseases such as cancer, obesity, or infertility. And we know one of the most important is bifenols that, link, that we can find it already in lactin memory gland or in nasal in mice exposed, but even in women nowadays we can detect it. So, and it is really very toxic for, for kids. What is epigenetic? Genetic has been defined as today, generally as accept the study of changes in gene function that are mitotally in one in a one of the moments of the division of, uh, of the meiosis and do not entail a change in the near sequence. Well, these endocrine disruptors can change it. Then it's a pathology, a very severe and difficult way how to treat it. Another thing that is really very dangerous is that even you can have some generational inheritances of epigenetics. Uh, what it means that the grandmother, if he has been in very straight contact of this kind of products, can transmit it to the, her descendants through those changes or mutations of these genes or chromosomes. These epigenetic changes produce male fertility, and now that we know it, uh, they turn the, the exposure of existing female right during the period of gonadal sexual termination 
is produced by an anti anti-adrenergic compound that we can found it in sometimes in, in food or on different kinds of plastic, omedoclidol, that is an estrogen compound. So they act over their, this, the, the hormones and this produce alteration of the spermatogenic capacity and increase the incidence of male infertility. And it can be transferred through the male germ to the nearly all males of the subsequent generations ex uh, examined. And why? Because those changes of genetics alteration, the changes of the epigenetic uh, is transmitted directly through the spermatozoa. And they produce uh, different types of patterns of germ lines that is the reason that why kids can have these changes produced by their own father. Uh, the ability of an environmental factor as an endocrine interrupter to reprogram the germ is terrible because they change directly the genetics of these uh, persons. And what are the toxic elements that, that surround us? Pesticides, herbicides, heat stabilizer, chemical analysis, pollution, plastic, compounds of pharmacological product, nourishing livestock, food, preservative, diluents, compacts, cosmetic. We know we are talking about that it can be uh, absorbed through the skin or cleaning products. We must learn. Here you can have the different types of vegetables that can you have a, a, a very high number of pesticides that can affect directly to human beings like tomatoes, pears, orange, uh, lettuce, santis, uh, red or, uh, or green tea from China, um, strawberries. We have it all around us. So we must look how can we be protected of them. Eggs are one of the foods that usually have pesticide residues higher than the uh, United and uh, European Union standard. Even in June 2017, German, German Authority in Hanover removed more than 37,000 Dutch eggs from supermarket after they found that were contaminated by fipronil. That's it's really terrible because eggs is a normal uh, food that we eat very frequently and we eat. Fillers are a sort of plastic that also can be uh, very dangerous that they produce anti adrenergic so they reduce the production of testosterone and affect the target organs as the testicle even during the fetal development period in until the puberty phase. So through all the, the growing of people can be affected. Nowadays they are very controlled, but we have we are finding the phyllites in the urine analysis. Human urinary phyllites, what I am telling, uh, we can be uh, we can find the, those metabolites level in higher quantities in urine, even in seven parameters as chromatin factor, spermaploidy or reproductive hormones. They are they act in different ways, as you see in the chromatin of the sperm, in the spermatozoa, or even in those hormones that help the production of those uh, spermatozoa. So it's really terrible because they, doesn't, they not only act in one way, they act in different way. So it's very important of human reproduction health, the widespread using of phylat. It is important for the investigation to correlate them, but we know exactly that that is happening now a day. And what we can do? Clinicians, like uh, and the odontologists and the colleagues, must always attempt to identify the etiology of the possible testicular toxicity and where it is acting and what they are doing to try to change this, this situation. Assess the degree of risk to the patient evaluating for infertility to know exactly what we, until where we can do to change the situation and initiate a plan to control and prevent exposure to other ones association between occupation, toxicant, and fertility has been established. That's really very important because we can change some of those things. And we, what we are doing, we include counseling for a new way of life as a prevention and treatment even in main fertility. We know to combine that it's important to know what we are using 
for IVF techniques or reproduction because sperm that are uh, it's in, are, um, are making as a transport of the chromosomes can be the horse that can introduce into the embryos those mutations. So we have a transgenerational epigenetic alteration. And we must make, nowadays, it's really very important to make evaluation of the main factor in genetic study that we can do nowadays, most of them. As the DNA fragmentation index in sperm, and approach to this through a testicular biopsy, so we can see directly what is happening then, or uh, study in general, just like with PGT in embryo in IVF. And what we can do, we, can be, we must be informed and we must inform. Here you have different types of information about plastic that nowadays we are using. And then you know that uh, this one uh, can contain bisphenol A, so don't use it or even don't buy food that has this kind of product in his plastic. And this another uh, indication, uh, if they have filat, please don't use it. Don't drink water directly through the plastic bottles. It is better to protect it without having light directly and drink it in a, in a normal bottle, a crystal bottle. And what we can measure, even nowadays we can measure uh, the, uh, the, the quantity of PVC that is like plastic in, 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 in lipid that can cause a severe oligospermia. Uh, we, can, we, we must study, we make multiple study of genital situation in sperm, mayors study genetic screening and evidently uh, genetic counseling because sometimes we can do anything about it. So the patient must know where is the limit and where we can, until where we can do uh, reproduction techniques. Recommendation. I think that's, what, that's the most important what we are talking about. It. Do not use plastic to heat food in the microwave. Better not use plastic for liquids. Use glass always. Try to limit fats of animal origin because the, the, the fat of the animal origin um, has a very high quantity of endocrine disruptors. and They are very well used in, as an additive in food preparation. Try to use natural cosmetic and don't use it if they, you don't have enough information about it. Uh, use always, eat always organic fruit, vegetable without pesticides and insecticides. Save your nutrition to have better health. And what, what we must do, we must be, we must protect the, the, the future generation. We must be activists of our health. We are responsible for the future generation. We must be responsible for the continuity of human and its ability to reproduce correctly and in a natural way. And the scientific society will have the position themselves to protect lobbies of power. That's really very important. We must be seriously uh, taking care because nowadays more than 40% of People are looking to have kids, and most of them have male infertility due due of toxic products. That might, the governments must take it out from the market to protect the future generations. Because alteration in sperm quality and quality clearly put human reproduction really at risk, as we have seen nowadays already, the increase of incidence of oncological pathology in young people, as well as cryptorchidism, alteration of spermatogens, and many other alterations are marking us that they must take into account professional responsibility and change of approach in infertility treatment. These are almost new studies that we are already making to, to detect and to know what is happening with these endocrine disrupting chemical products and how they are uh, um, attacking, really, it's an attack against the spermatozoa and they use their own testicles as a target organ to destroy the, the testicle. 
So, uh, as you have seen, uh, we are we are investigating really a lot of things about it to try to change this terrible situation. Finally, it is a pleasure for me to share with you this time talking of about the forgotten infertility factor, that's the male factor, and the toxic effects that are surrounding us. Thank you so much for another um, that's for sure. I mean, uh, there are those that maybe sometimes you don't look at. That might be very good. Excuse me, I don't hear you as well now. Okay, um, just let us know if you can hear me now. It's okay. Yes, perfect. Perfect. So it just needed a, a second, I guess, but uh, I am right here. So I'm, once again, thank you so much for yet another brilliant presentation because uh, those are those little things, I guess, that we tend to not look at very often and yet they can be very um, troublesome for, for, for men in this case, right? So thank you so much indeed. This is a, an excellent topic, that's for sure. And thank you for explaining all the details. And well, now it is time to uh, answer some questions. Okay, Dr. Anna. So of course, let's have a look. Uh, there are some questions ready and I see people are typing. So uh, I guess you do uh, have, you do find interest in that. That's really good to hear. And let's have a look at the first question. Can I ask, what would you consider normal sperm morphology for someone aiming for natural pregnancy? Well, the World Organization has a limit of 15% of normal uh, sperm morphology. That's enough to have a normal, natural pregnancy rate. 15%. In the 19th, it was 50%. What is happening nowadays? that the quality of the, the, the sperm is going down, the seminal product is going down, down, and so we're, they are adapting the situation to the normal, uh, to, the, to, to the normal people who can have kids, but the, the truth is that, that we are going down and down. But nowadays we consider normal 15% of sperm morphology. Thank you. Sir. For that question. And uh, yes, this is a little bit scary knowing that maybe uh, it may change in the future. I am losing your, your I don't hear it, Neil. So well you cannot now. hear me? Uh, no, yes, now perfectly. Okay, so I guess just wait up like a few seconds more, okay? Sometimes that might be the problem, but um, I'm right here, okay? okay? So thank you once again, of course, for that uh, question. And let's have a look at the next one. My husband has 77% DNA fragmentation damage and has been prescribed turmeric tablets for three months. How effective is antioxidant treatment in bringing down damage? Oh, 77% is really, really high. It's really high. In the labs now in, in, in Spain, they are telling that it is a pathology uh, around 30%. That's not true. Uh, we have a lot of papers that demonstrate that with until 50% of the name fragmentation, uh, we can say they are normal. But uh, higher than 60%, it is really very pathologic. Uh, uh, I think that the most important thing is to detect where is the problem, why your husband has this DNA fragmentation, the kind of food he eats, uh, where he works, um, because some jobs you are directly in contact of toxics, uh, uh, even the frequency of relationships, because you must know the epidemios high, uh, make a very damage of the DNA of fragmentation of spermatozoid. In this condition, I recommend people to have their uh, sperm uh, screening with no more than three days of uh, sexual abstination. That's important. We, can, we must look if he has an infection in urine or in sperm. When you know exactly or more or less where can be the, the problem, you must try to change it or to treat it. And you can be helped with antioxidant treatment. Um, sometimes we cannot 
obtain good results, but I think that really it helps. It helps. Um, I think that the one of the best antioxidants for this kind of problem is having uh, the Q Q10 uh, antioxidant products are really very, very good. If you don't have any kind of natural pregnancy and your husband continue having 70% DNA fragmentation, then the best way to, to have a kid is making an IVF and taking the spermatozoa directly from the testicle. That are the youngest one, the best one normally, if, if the uh, endocrine disruptor are not affecting directly the testicle. That we can know it before, because when the, you make a medical history and, and, and physical exam, you make an exploration of the testicle and you can know more or less if you will have, have any problem there. More and you must make a study of spermato, uh, spermatozoa uh, fish. You can you you can do a lot of things to detect exactly where is the problem. And thank you so much, Alice, for your question. And again, Dr. Anna, for your answer to that with all, lots of details as well. Next question is: What is the method to test for toxic toxicity? Sorry, in our bodies. Wow, <laughs> it's really very difficult because toxicity is very, very wide, you know, it's toxicity is all what we have, this, the plastic of this table, of the, of the top lab, um, can affect us. The most important thing is to live with, uh, as the most natural way of life as you can. Uh, indirectly, if you make blood screening, you can see important changes of each of the organ as the liver, kidneys, and there you can find uh, impact of the toxicity in your body. And thank you once again for yet another brilliant question. Let's have a look. Karen has added one more. You mentioned there are endocrine disruptors in animal fats. Is there also endocrine disruptors in animal meats products? As I imagine, most of them co contain fats. Sure, sure. It's like this. Uh, more of more of the the um, the animal um, food that they eat have this endocrine disruptor. I don't know if you remember. Uh, more or less 15 years ago, it has a very great problem with the, the meat that were they finding estrogen-like products that they are using to grow up very quickly uh, those animals, uh, like a kitten, chicken. So um, you will find these endocrine disruptors in meat in all kinds of products because all of them has fats, even, even, they give them fat because the fat is the, the product that makes good taste of your food. So they give men, they give them artificial uh, fat to have better taste of this meat. All right, again, thank you so much for that. Okay, and let's have a look. Now we will have a bit of a longer question. So my husband and I eat 99% organic food and and generally quite aware of not using plastics, but our water comes in big bottles, which we decanter in glass bottles. Does this make a difference? Likewise, is using silicone to cover heat foods better than clean film? How disruptive is having stainless steel and aluminum with acrylic uh, at artwork in our rooms, as I have a lot of artwork that I've designed using these materials. I think, Angela, that you're doing it very, very well. We must eat organic food. And this is a way, a different way of life, a different way of living. And um, I think that the pandemic that we are uh, having all around the world must change in a better way of life. I hope this. And one of those things is making what you are doing. It's really important. Uh, but unfortunately, it's impossible really to change it uh, so quickly. 
it's it, uh, it's one by one we might we must do it uh, in the future probably we'll have a better houses with less um, toxic products and sometimes some of them are really not toxic but uh, i think that normally what you are doing is quite well Indeed, thank you so much, Angela, for that little question and a great one for sure as well. Thank you so much, indeed. Okay, uh, let's have a look. Next question is, so what test could be carried out on the sperm when undergoing IVF? Well, one of the most important things that you must know is that uh, um, the, a sperm screening is only a photo finish of when a man ejaculates in that moment. You must know that the, from the stem cell until the spermatozoa, we need more or less two months and a half and three months. And men produce constantly uh, through the tubules this amount of spermatozoa that are changing, changing. So when you are undergoing IBF, first of all, we must know why you need an IBF. And if we can change something, we can try to have a natural pregnancy or a better result of this IVF. There are a lot of different types of tests, but the most important thing is go to the, your doctor, to your andrology, and then he will make correctly his job to know what is happening and what he can change to have better results in IVF. Wonderful, thank you so much for yet another advice. And let's have a look. Question is, can seminal plasma anomalies cause issues? Also, my husband's sperm morphology is six. The range starts from four. Is this enough? It is enough for IBF. More, less than four, you will have trouble and difficulties to have a good result with them. But the most important thing is to know why he have this morphology alteration. He can have an infection, he can have a varicose cell. Varicose cell is really terrible with sperm morphology. And if he can be operated, we can have good results, even 42% of natural pregnancy. That is really very, very important. Imagine that in the United States, the, the health companies doesn't pay any kind of IVF if the man has a varicose cell and is not operated. So, you must do, um, the doctor must do a physical examination and if he detects a varicose cell, he may, he may uh, choose what he must do. And normally he must make an, an operation to take out a varicose selectomy. That's really not difficult. It's only one hour in the operating room and in the same day he can go back at home. You must rest three or four days and it's enough. All right. Once again, thank you so much for yet another interesting question. Okay, and let's have a look. Okay, one more here. If you eat organic animal products, is that also a problem? Uh, it is less problematic because it is very, very difficult to have uh, um, food even animal products, without any kind of toxic. That we know that uh, we must eat less meat that we are eating in the occidental society. But it's not as a great problem because nowadays the governments are taking very well care about the, the, the control of the organic products. Understood again. Thank you so much. And there's a thank you from Karen actually also, also here. Um, okay. So next question. Are you saying we should eliminate all animal products? I thought fat is important to make carbons. Um, I say that animal products have a lot of fat with a lot of toxic products. But uh, the, the human we are adapting year by year, time by time, to the new situation of the society. We are not the same that 100 years ago, that if they, people that was living 100 or 200 years ago, cannot eat what we are eating nowadays, because they will get very late. So uh, <laughs> we must moderate what we are eating. 
and we must naturally it's very difficult to change so 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 rapid so quickly those things so it is important to um, to take really care what we must eat the best thing what we can the problem is that uh, organic products uh, animal organic products are really expensive nowadays so so only few people can eat about this kind of quality all right again thank you so much indeed for that explanation okay and now let's have a look so when testing bacteria pathogens in sperm does the sperm need to be alive on, or can you also get results on sperm that is tested a few days after the sample is produced right, when testing bacteria yes yeah, sure it can be alive but uh, you know, you know that um, it must be alive. But uh, the testing of bacterium pathogen in sperm is a different type of uh, sperm uh, screening. We make a biological culture, so we detect which kind of bacteria we have or kind of pathogen we have, and with it we can make an antibiotic or a treatment, a specific treatment. All right, again, thank you so much indeed for that explanation. And uh, let's have a look if we have more questions. I see that some someone asked about recording. Uh, yes, of course, it's possible. Uh, it will be available tomorrow, okay? I will send you a link in a second. And in the meantime, Karen has added one more. Uh, I mean, to, clarif to clarify it, it must be alive. Sure. You can take a sample and leave it in the freezer <laughs> or uh, in your table two or three days. The, in the moment that you take the sample, you must bring it to the lab. All right. Thank you so much for the clarification as well. Someone is typing, so let's give it a minute and let's have a look if we have more questions. And we will be slowly finishing. So, of course, if you haven't asked your question, now it is time to do so. And, uh, and just go ahead and type this in. Let's let's give it a second. And as I've mentioned, the recording will be available on the site that I have just sent to you. So also on my IV offenses, but um, also on our YouTube channel. So simply subscribe that way, you know, uh, when it's uploaded as well. And let's still have a minute to see the question. Okay, yeah, here it is. Okay, that's an interesting question, and actually we got two more of those. Um, so what is your view or your prediction on how male fertility is going to decline and look like in the future? Better than tell it. <laughs> Better than that. Um, um, uh, we have a very great problem, I think, uh, because it is true that we are doing a lot of studies, but the problem is that nowadays, People think that when, if you have an IVF, it's enough to have kids, and it's not true. Because the problem that we are having with this kind of endocrine disruptor are more than only infertility, that is really serious. Because uh, the population, for example, of Europe are becoming older and older because we don't have new kids. People are also older to have kids. So we'll have a very social, very dangerous situ situation because we doesn't have change of new generation. Uh, from these 30 last years, we are going, we are looking at the claim of the quality and the quality of the spermatogenesis of the sperm quality. And we are going up and up about male infertility cases. Because more of the people think that if I have one spermatozoa, it's enough to have one kid, and that it's not true. Men produce millions of spermatozoa because only very few has the fertility quality to uh, fertilize the seed. All right, thank you, definitely. For an interesting question, maybe um, it's the, the answer is not as we would like, but that's the truth. Yeah, and so we just need to deal with it, I guess. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and let's have a look at the next question. 
Okay, um, Karen has added, yeah, in regards to the Alive uh, sperm. So one clinic provides postal service overseas, and I'm, I'm a bit worried about this, as of course the sperm wouldn't be alive. Uh, it depends of what kind of uh, studies he must do. If it is genetic, there is no problem. But if it is a quality fertilizing test, it must be alive. I think that some of those studies must be uh, directed. And bacterial pathogen, sure. Um, overseas, it's in the in the in few hours, few hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it must be alive, yes, in order yeah. for to, to check it. Okay, thank you so much for the clarification, and of course your follow ups, Karen, as well. Um, okay. Yeah, let me have a look. Okay. Um, okay, Angela, I just simply, I guess, uh, yeah, this is like a um, thank you so much, Angela, for, um, you know, your um, comments here as well. And again, someone is typing. So I just want to make sure that we, whether we have a question or not, uh, but I guess we will be finishing. So uh, before we do, Dr. Anna, anything, any final words tonight? <laughs> First of all, thank you to you who remind me to stay with you and help uh, all the men who has infertility troubles to find a, a light uh, for fertilizing and having a baby. I think that we must be really positive because uh, nowadays more and more people are taking um, really uh, seriously the possibility of uh, testing male infertility, and this is very, 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 um, very important. It is really very important because if you think that one spermatozoa is one kid, we'll have great problems. We are not treating spermatozoa. We are treating men who have male infertility as the same different types of specialty in medicine. We are not treating one organ, we treat a patient, and that is really important. Excellent. Thank you so much. And before we finish, one more question. And this question, I'm sure you receive definitely lots and lots of times. What supplements could you recommend to improve sperm quality? And I, in the future, if you want, we can make a one webinar like this one, talking about the different types of supplement. Uh, Personally, I think that uh, we must choose the medication that the patient must take depending on his situation, medical situation. Supplements really are these supplements. If you have a good diet, if you have a good health, if you take care of your, your, your food and way of life, normally you will don't need any kind of supplements. You will need specific supplements depending on the situation of your, of your sperm screening, of your medical history, of your ex, uh, physical exploration. Then we will choose one specific for it. But not all of them are good, even they are useful. Some of them are really doesn't, you are throwing your money buying some of those supplements that really doesn't serve of anything. All right. Thank you so much. And yes, I'm definitely would love to do another webinar with you on supplements. This is always something patients will ask. And of course, that's obvious. Anyone would like to be able to simply um, improve the quality um, with, with that. So thanks so much. And we will be finishing. Um, Dr. Anna, it's been a pleasure to have you. And of course, as you can see, some of those thank yous are for you right here. Very interesting webinar. Thank you for interesting presentation. Wise advice. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really, as you can see, it's been very, very useful to everyone. So I'm very happy that uh, we are still here and we are still, as you know, every single day. And I'm so very happy that you are coming here and asking questions. And uh, yeah. That will be it for tonight. Once again, let me remind everyone that, of course, uh, if you would like to get in touch with Dr. Anna or any anyone, um, the team from Repro Clinic in Barcelona, feel free to do so. 
I am sure they will be more than happy to help you out. And uh, well, I can always, I can only add uh, best of luck to everyone. And of course, Dr. Anna, again, thanks a lot for joining. I do hope to uh, see you quite soon, I hope as well. And of course, um, take care, everyone. Okay, thank you so much and have a lovely evening. And I hope to see you tomorrow. We will be here, of course, at 8 p.m. UK time. So just sign up if you haven't already. Thank you, Dr. Anna. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you. Hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.